Hey everyone, good to see you again, or at least you can see me. Can you believe it? We're already beginning week four. And this week we're going to be moving away from the long epics and drama and moving into something that uh, is a little more familiar with something that will seem more modern to us, and that is lyric poetry. Lyric poetry, which if it sounds a little bit like the lyrics of a song, that's probably because that's exactly what these are. These are generally very short poems sung that uh, are about one's personal feelings, often in first person, and it still is the dominant poetic form today. When a lot of people write poetry today, they are often writing the one thing they know well, and that is how they feel and what's in their heart. And they tend to be shorter. Uh, I'm not sure I'd want to read a 40,000 line epic about how anyone feels. But uh, it's also a skill though, a great skill to keep it from becoming sappy and sentimental and something that resonates with people and where people can find uh, familiarity in, in how they feel. They can say, I, I know how that feels and that captures how I feel perhaps better than I could have captured it myself. Well, Sappho was perhaps the greatest lyric poet of the ancient world. And we're gonna spend this week reflecting on her. And sadly, despite the fact that she had, had she wrote possibly as many as 10,000 poems. Uh, most of them are lost. And as a matter of fact, the vast majority of them are lost. All that remains is about 600 fragments. And these fragments were quotes from other sources that we've been able to pull. Now, the fact that most of these don't exist is not any slight on Sappho but rather a great tribute to her because the fact that anything survives is evidence that people treasured her the fact that people quoted her the fact that people memorized her it shows how incredibly important these songs were to them these were their hits uh back then and these were the things you might use to woo a lover to tell a spouse how much you love them. So Sappho uh, lived about somewhere, now these are approximate dates, uh, uh, 630 to 570 before the Common Era. If you wonder what BCE stands for, it's not BC anymore, which is before Christ. We've gone to a more secularized version of that, which is the before the Common Era. Same, same splitting point. And uh, we actually almost know nothing about her. The, about the only thing that we really do know about her is that she was from the island of Lesbos. It's an island there among many islands in the Mediterranean, there near Greece. And if you're wondering if everybody on Lesbos was a lesbian, the answer would be yes. But that's because a lesbian is just somebody who is from Lesbos. But the fact that Sappho was very likely from her poems, uh, lesbian or at least bisexual, we had now refer to people who are lesbian uh, in our sense, uh, in tribute to her actually, this is meant as an honor as lesbian. So, uh, just because someone is from Lesbos, yes, they are lesbian in the truest sense, but we get the term because of Sappho, her incredible fame and regard is actually what gives us that term. And one of the things is Le uh, Sappho has been depicted in art for literally thousands of years because she really in some ways is the queen of lyric poetry. All great poets see themselves as inheritors of the art that Sappho had. And uh, so here we have 
uh, an image from an old jar where we have another poet named Alcius, whose poetry is completely lost. We have no idea what any of his poems sounded like, but he's here with Sappho. Um, this is something quite modern here where someone has actually just made something beautiful trying to depict one of her love poems. When we refer to sapphic love, we mean love in the form of Sappho. Um, and uh, one of the interesting things about art that I would say, as a lover of art, if you go to a museum and you see any uh, myth depicted, like from the Odyssey or even the Bible, you'll notice that in many ways the images are less accurate representations of what it probably would have looked like back then and more a representation of life in the time of the artist. Art generally tells us more about the artist and his or her age. So for example, here we have an image of Sappho and Phaon, who again, they were famous for being lovers. We don't know if it's actually true. Um, this looks a little bit more like uh, the Renaissance period in Europe than it does in the Greek period. And uh, there we have uh, Eros there, who's helping to spur on that love. I love this image though. Um, here we have a uh, later work as we're starting to get closer to the modern period where we have Sappho depicted. Notice she's always depicted with a harp because I want you to think of her in many ways. She's the pop artist of her day. She is the, uh, the Beatles of her day, if you will. She is uh, the Beyonce of her day. Um, here's another one from the 1860s. Notice this is not uh, a Greek uh, woman from the, the seventh century BC. This is definitely somebody from the 1860s. Um, so it tells, a, tells us a little bit more about the artist and his time. However, it's interesting that they're still depicting her in this way. I love this 20th century piece, um, more by Lumini, and it's, it, it's, I, it really actually captures the vibrancy I think you'll see in the poetry, I'm hoping. Um, again, here's another piece from the 19th century. Again, this has little to do with the Greeks, but it shows you how fascinated they were with this time period. And it has Sappho singing to Homer. We have no idea if they ever met each other. Um, probably not. Um, but that makes for a wonderful story, doesn't it, to imagine that that even the great Homer would be enamored by her or enamored with her. Now here we have a piece from 2011 by William Ayton, and it's called Sappho Descending. And this actually comes from a tradition. We have no evidence that this is true. Uh, as a matter of fact, a lot of scholars are very skeptical of this, but the story goes that toward the end of her life, she uh, was spurned by her lover, Phaon, and she then threw herself off a cliff to her death. Um, whatever, we have no idea if that's true. Uh, some people have even argued that this story was invented just to soften her, her homosexuality and, and create her into more of a traditional a heterosexual sexual female, yeah, we all know. Uh, but it does uh, uh, add to the mythology of her, uh, the tragedy of her, if you will. Um, again, here's another very contemporary piece, still trying to capture her. So here we are, uh, well over 2,500 years later, still trying to capture the essence of of her because she is in some ways the, the muse, if you will, of lyric poetry. Now remember that Zeus has nine daughters who are the muse, the muses, but uh, after a while the Greeks began to say there must be a 10th who inspires lyric poetry and that must be Sappho. I don't like this picture at all though because Sappho looks kind of ugly there. I don't like right? I don't know uh, that if she looked like that at all. And I'm not sure why she's getting a nice little shove 
other than it's from Eros, otherwise known as Cupid, other than to suggest that love made her do it. So uh, anyway, what I would like you to do, I'm asking you to, to do in the first session, it's not a video of me, but rather I just would like you to spend some time with Sappho. I would like you to just read her poems. And here's how to do it. If you're not, if you've not experienced reading poetry, especially lyric poetry, you have to imagine that this is an art form that requires thought. It requires something that is almost impossible to get in our noisy society anymore. You need to go find a quiet place where you can be away from your phone, be away from the television, be away from the noise, and just go somewhere alone for a while where you can maybe at first feel a little uncomfortable with your own thoughts and then begin to read. And poetry, like music, is meant to be done aloud. So read these little fragments, knowing that they're just fragments. Read them aloud. Think of somebody you love. There must be somebody you're in love with. Maybe you're dating somebody. Maybe you wish you were dating somebody. Maybe you have hopes of, of marrying somebody. Think of that person. Or maybe better yet, think of somebody that you wish they would sing these songs to you. And see if she captures that essence of love. Love for friends in some of them. And love for a loved one or lover. And so just read them. Read them aloud. If you like one, read it again. If you don't like one, go to the next one. And I'm excited to see, because I've asked you at the end of session one, in the dialogue, to in the discussion, to talk a little bit about which one grabbed you. There has to be one. I refuse to believe that there won't be at least one that somehow speaks to you. Uh, because I believe in the power of poetry. I love poetry. I recognize that only about 8% of the population reads poetry anymore. But I think that that is less because of poetry and more because that requires something that, that also is hurting religion. And that's the inability of us to be able to be quiet and to listen and to be comfortable with our own thoughts. So it's going to be a great week. I can't wait to see what you have to say this week. And I hope you have a great week. Uh, pay attention. You do have a paper that will be due here in, in a, what, a little over a week. And also, I want you to note that at the end of the semester, of course, there is a research project slash paper. And it's not too early to begin thinking about that. Hey, we're going to have a great week. Thank you so much, everybody.